And now, Mystery Theater. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. And, as you may suspect, I have a tale to tell. A tale full of sound and terror and uh, signifying... Well, I'll have to leave that to you. And I also ask your indulgence when I personalize this strange riddle... because this story was brought directly to me. Ever since I've been your host on this series... I have the feeling that you expect me to be an expert on the macabre. But I must confess to a sense of surprise... when I was buttonholed by a young man the other day who said... Excuse me, Mr. Marshall, but I have a coffin that I'm sure will interest you. You cannot frighten me. I am not leaving this graveyard until I get to the bottom of this. I warn you, your persistence will be your destruction. I still trust in the Lord. Where, where is that music coming from? From beyond the grave. Is it Judgment Day? No. Then you talk nonsense. The dead will rise... The Lord will summon his elect to meet him in the clouds. But until that day, the dead remain buried. Our mystery drama, A Coffin for the Devil, was especially adapted for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Keir DeLay. What do you do when a perfect stranger tells you he has a coffin which might interest you? My first instinct was to tell a young man that I wasn't in the market for coffins. But he quickly explained that he wasn't a salesman, but an avid listener to our series, and that he had a macabre story of a strange coffin that had been in his family for generations. I was intrigued. So the next night, I found myself in his old suburban house, drinking coffee with his wife, Cora, and his friend, Professor Gerald Barker, and looking at a large wooden box, which appeared to me to be a case for a bass fiddle. This box, although you may not believe it, Mr. Marshall, is a coffin. And this letter, which my wife, Cora, found in the attic, explains how it came in our family, and also how it happens that I'm not today a mortician. It was written by my great-grandfather, whose name was also William Spindles. And the letter begins... I, William Spindles, swear this to be a true and honest account of the strange happenings that befell me when I was employed by Edward Rogers, the undertaker, in the year 1851. The month was December, and Mr. Rogers and his good wife paying pre-Christmas visits, had left me in charge of the shop. It was a cold night and blowing hard, but my good friend Richard Clay and I were snug enough with a big fire going in the stove. Only for you, William Spindles, would I spend a stormy night like this sitting in an undertaker's parlor. Ah, come on now, Dick. You've kept me company often enough to know that there's no harm in corpses. Well, it's not the corpses that worry me. It's it's their spirits that may be around. There's no such thing as spirits, Mr. Rogers says, that there's no harm in the dead. The harm is in people's minds. Oh, maybe, maybe. Uh, What's that? Someone's at the door. Come in. Oh, I don't like this. I'll see who it is. Come in, sir. Come in. You'll catch your death of cold standing out there. I'm sorry to disturb you on a night like this, but my need is urgent. I require a coffin. Yes, sir. Did you have a particular type in mind? Very particular. I know exactly what I need. Well, we have a complete stock in the next room. Now, if you'll follow me... No need. You won't have it in stock. We carry the most complete line in the state. That's why I have come here. Well, thank you. Now, if you'll tell me... Who the coffin is for, I'll be able to help you better. For me. For for you? You mean it's for your own your own personal use? Exactly. Uh, I can see you're going to be busy, Bill, so I'll run along. Oh, no, 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 no need to leave, Dick. This gentleman will have to come back tomorrow and see Mr. Rogers, so I... I cannot return. Well, Mr. Rogers, the proprietor, and I honestly believe you'll be better served if you wait for him. I can draw you the way the coffin must be. Here. 
Here's fifty dollars. Will that cover it? But I... uh, goodbye, Bill. I really must leave. Amy's expecting me. Is the fifty dollars enough? It's not the money I was thinking of. It's the special requirements you mentioned. I'm not sure I can handle them. I said I'd draw it. Do you have paper? I guess so. I... Here's a pencil. I have my own. Now, the shape must be exactly like this. Just so. But that doesn't look like a coffin at all. It's, it's more like the case for a musical instrument. I know my needs. Oh, never in my life have I seen or heard of a coffin such as you ask for. It but... must be exactly the way I've drawn it. Very well. Now, it must also have lids and hinges. Hinges? Right. Hinges. You see them here on the drawing. Yes, but you... And a lock on the inside. The... The inside? And a good quality lock. Secure. Nothing shoddy, you understand? I believe I do. Good. Now, if you have a tape measure, I want you to measure me around. But... But why? I mean, the drawing is... It's unusual. It's very clear. I want to make sure that you leave enough room for my arms. I really don't know how I'm going to explain this to Mr. Rogers. Show him the drawing. Now, take my measurements. Yes, sir. Uh, all right, now leave enough room for y your arms. Now, make sure that this is ready by Friday. But that's the day after tomorrow. I must have it. I'm sorry to be so particular, but I've been buried before. And this time, I want to have it my own way. What are you talking about? Dick told me about that strange man who came here. Dick was really scared. He said the man wanted to order his own coffin. That's right, but I'm sure it was some kind of practical joke. Well, I don't care what it was. I want you to find another job. I hate the idea of your being an undertaker. Lucy, we've been through this before, and this job is no different than any other except in people's minds. I'm sorry, Bill. I'm sorry. I'm just so frightened. All the way over here, I was just worried about you and... And, and scared, but... But I came anyway, and now... Oh, Bill, I don't think it's going to work. Oh, I'd like to punch Dick Clay right in the nose for frightening you like that. Oh, I don't blame Dick. It's not his fault. If he hadn't scared you, you wouldn't have... Yes, I would. Maybe I wouldn't have come here tonight, but... I hate what you're doing. I hate it. I know, honey. What do you want me to do? Quit. And do what? Oh, I don't care. What will we live on? Well, you'll find another job. Nowhere near as much money. I don't care about the money. Bill, can't you understand? I don't want hands touching me. That have been touching death all day. <sighs> all right, Lucy. Uh, I'll speak to Mr. Rogers about leaving. Good morning, Bill. Good morning. Now, what's all this about some excitement you had here last night? Well, good morning, Mr. Rogers. I guess Dick Clay has been busy gossiping again. Well, I don't know whether it came from Dick or not, but I heard it from the barber. Some ridiculous claptrap about a walking cadaver ordering its own coffin. Well, sir, what happened was unusual. How so? Take a look at this. Hmm? This is a drawing made by the gentleman who ordered this coffin. Hmm. Remarkable. Looks something like a carrying case for a the, the bass fiddle. Yes, sir. It looks that way to me also. It must be ready tomorrow evening. You're worried about something, aren't you, Bill? <sighs> yes, sir. Something to do with this special order? I suppose so, in a way. Mr. Rogers, I'm sorry to tell you that I'm going to have to leave here. What? You mean because of last night? Only partially. It's really because of Lucy. Oh... I suppose she's upset about the idea of marrying a mortician. Hmm? Uh, more than upset. She's... Well, she practically gave me a choice. Either this job or her. I wouldn't worry about that if I were you, Bill. Now, you're not me and you're not engaged to Lucy. I'm sorry, Bill. It's just that I've been there before. I had the same problem with Mrs. Rogers before we got married. Well, what did you do? Before I answer that, how do you feel about the business? I mean, would you stay on if Lucy would marry you? I think so. 
Bill, you know I have no son. No one to carry on. I've never said it, but I think you know how I feel about you and what hopes I have that you might be the one to carry on. Until today, I thought you felt the same way. I don't think I can change Lucy's mind. Of course you can't. But you just said that... You can't. But Mrs. Rogers can. Now, ask Lucy to talk with her, woman to woman. That's your best bet. My wife knows all the problems and she has all the answers. Uh, I never thought of that. All the same, I... I wish you'd been here last night. It was... Well, the only word I can use to describe what happened is weird. Because he ordered a coffin for himself? That, plus the way he came in and... And then the strange shape he insisted on. But most of all, because he appeared to be driven... Almost as if he were compelled to do what he was doing. What he felt or didn't feel isn't important, Bill. What matters is whether you've changed the way you think about death. I don't follow you. You have to see dying for what it is, Bill. Life's ultimate destination. It's nothing to be afraid of. It's just an inescapable fact. In the course of my life, I've met a lot of people. And I'm good at judging them. And up until now, I've thought of you as a no-nonsense, feet-on-the-ground, level-headed young man. But, sir, you didn't see this man. You, you didn't hear the terrible desperation he had I've in his I've seen and heard almost everything since I started some 18 years ago. This poor fellow who ordered his coffin from you last night was obviously deranged. No question about it. Deranged. I hope you're right, sir. Of course I'm right. What other conclusion can there be? The one I can't get out of my head. He told me he'd been buried once before. And this time, he means to have it his own way. Oh, very good. Very good indeed. You find that amusing? Now I understand everything. <laughs> that coffin he ordered is nothing but a big fiddle case. Uh, a double bass box. And he must be a musician. They're the very devil for playing practical jokes. Don't you see? This is nothing but a practical joke. A joke on whom, sir? How should I know? Some fellow musician. No, I'm sorry, sir. I just can't believe that. Why not? Why wouldn't he have told me so? Why would he try to scare the daylights out of me and then pay fifty dollars? Fifty whole dollars, besides. Ah, well. I expect we'll have the answer to that tomorrow evening when he comes to get his coffin. That is, if he comes at all. Oh, he'll be here, I'm sure of that. I just pray that we won't be sorry when he comes. <laughs> When the reading stopped, I looked at the faces in that sane and sensible 20th century living room. Spindle's wife, Cora, was wide-eyed. Professor Barker's lips were pursed and his eyes were skeptical. My eyes were drawn automatically to the subject of the letter. The large, strangely shaped coffin that stood in the corner of the living room. And I could understand the fear that had gripped that 19th century William Spindle's. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. I suppose to the three inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, one could add the right of a man to order his own handmade coffin. Most of us, I believe, would find the thought distasteful but the feeling that prevailed among us in the living room of William Spindles was one of curiosity. We were all anxious for him to continue reading the letter from his great-great-grandfather. I must confess that my work suffered during that day. My thoughts were not on what I was doing, but on what the evening would bring and what Mr. Rogers would make of the stranger when he came to call for his coffin. The day passed somehow. Bill, when did this customer of yours say he'd be back? Early in the evening. Matt, we'll give him another half hour and then we'll lock up. Uh, that won't help if he wants to pick it up. What does that mean, young man? Someone tampered with the coffin and we don't know who. We only have Sam's word that the coffin was tampered with. But he's our best workman. Well, like everyone else around here, I'm sure he's been infected with the idea that there's something strange about this order for a coffin in the shape of a bass fiddle. At last, he's arrived. Those wraps didn't come from the door. Nonsense. Of course they did. It's cold out there. He wants to come in. I'll prove it to you. I'll open the door. No need. He's letting himself in. Sir? Sir, there... There's no one at the door. Get hold of yourself, Bill. Must have been a draft that blew the door open. 
I'll close it myself. Good evening, uh, Mr. Rogers. Is my order ready? Well, good evening, sir. Come in, come in. The box you ordered is ready. Thank you. My dear sir, you really should wear a great coat and a muffler in this bitter weather. You catch cold. Where's my coffin? Ah, that's it, in the corner. Mm -hmm. Satisfactory? Very satisfactory. Is there a good secure lock on the inside? You may open the lid and see for yourself. That way you can also test the hinges. Hmm. Well, the make of the lock is unknown to me. Is it a good one? We never have had a single complaint about any of our coffins. So I'd heard. Now then, where would you like it sent? I'll take it with me. My dear sir, it's much too heavy for one man to carry. I'll manage. Perhaps you have a horse and cart outside. We can help you get it on. That won't be necessary. May I have your name? My name is of no importance. Sir, I'm a reputable undertaker. I must keep my records in order. Any name you choose will do. Come now, sir. I see through your little joke, and I don't disapprove, but you must... Joke? Mr. Rogers, if there's any joke being played here, it's on me. So, I'll take my coffin and be on my way. But, sir, you can't just walk out of here with a... Thanks to you for your efforts, and I wish you gentlemen good night's sleep. Sir, come back. Let him go. For the love of heaven, let him go, Mr. Rogers. He he lifted that box as if it were as light as a feather. Get your coat. What for? To follow him, Bill. Couldn't you see the man is ill? We're the ones who are going to be ill if we follow him. Stop babbling and get into your coat. All right, I'll, all right, I'll go with you. I don't want you following that, that spirit alone, but I tell you, he's not mortal. He is, he is, and he's sick, mentally ill. Hurry. How far do we follow him? As far as he goes. No, sir, I... I won't, because I believe his destination is hell. There he goes. Around the corner, down Green Tree Lane. Oh, yeah, I see him. Where can he be heading? There are no houses after a block of Green Tree Lane. But there's the cemetery. Didn't I tell you he was deranged? The cemetery gate's locked. The locks never bothered spirits. Then he's no spirit. Didn't he ask for a lock on the coffin? Oh, let him go, Mr. Rogers, please. Hurry up, hurry up before we lose him. Mr. Rogers, if we do catch up to him, what in heaven's name do you want of him? Find out who he is, where he lives, and get him safely home. Then I shall call a doctor to attend him. There he goes, heading directly for the cemetery gate. Confound it. What's happened to the moon? A cloud just passed in front of it. No matter. Even if we can't see him, we shall catch up when he finds the gate locked. Here comes the moonlight, and here's the gate. Where did he go? Well, he must have gone in. <clears throat> Gate's locked. Uh, well, I have my key. You, you don't intend to go in, do you? Of course. Come on, come on. Uh, no, sir. There. There. Isn't that our man? Moving among the trees over there near the Addison Mausoleum? Mr. Rogers, I've had enough of this. I'm going home. And allow that poor soul to do himself some kind of mischief? Sir, that poor soul, as you call him, is a person I I want nothing to do with. I don't know whether he's man, ghost, or devil, but whatever he is, and whatever his business is in the cemetery, I want no part of it. Bill, when a man's dead, he's dead. I've never seen a man or woman come to life again. I'm a God-fearing man, and I go by the Bible. Doesn't the good book say dust to dust? The Bible says a lot of things, but I remember no mention of men who could lift a heavy coffin as if it were a pillow and pass through locked gates without leaving a sound to say nothing of a man ordering his own coffin. Very well. Very well, Bill. You can stay or leave. I'm going after him. I beg Don't of close you. Close the gate. I beg of you, Mr. Rogers, leave this be and come home with me. Close the gate and make sure it's locked. Right. At this point, Bill Spindles stopped reading and put down the letter. My reaction was shared by his wife, Cora, who almost screamed at him. Don't tell me the letter stops there, and we're not going to find out what happened. The the reason I stopped is because the story my great-grandfather was telling up to now was his. But it now changes. At this point, he is writing not what he saw, but what he heard, as he puts it in the letter. Perhaps I was a coward, but I allowed Mr. Rogers to go on into the graveyard alone while I hurried home. So I warn the reader of this letter. This portion of my tale 
is written here as it was told to me by Mr. Rogers. The moon again had gone behind the clouds when young Spindles went hurrying off. But I thought I saw some light in or around the big Addison tomb. I started that way, and then I heard what seemed to be the voice of the man I was following. But it seemed to come from far off. Too far. You have come too far on a useless journey, Edward Rogers. Turn back before it's too late. Where are you, sir? Listen to me. Thrice they tried, and thrice they died. Where are you? What are you doing with your coffin? Leave here, Edward Rogers. Your business with the dead is finished. You don't belong here. And what do you do here? I keep an age-old bargain. With whom? You must leave here. This place is dangerous for you. But not for you? Leave before it's too late. The Lord will protect me. Now let me help you. <laughs> don't you understand? You're ill. You need help. So be it, Edward Rogers. You want to join in a dance of death. The consequences will be on your head. Here. I show myself to you. Here I am. See if you can catch me. It was then that I started after him. I could see him almost clearly. He seemed to be heading for the Addison tomb. He was carrying the coffin, and I was certain I could overtake him. But he kept dodging behind headstones. I turned and twisted after him. And then my foot caught. I lost my balance and fell, hitting my head against the tombstone. Dick, wake up, wake uh, up, man. Well, I, well, Bill, Bill, what do you want? Get dressed. You've got to come to the cemetery with me. What? The cemetery? Are you out of your mind? Mr. Rogers went in there after the man who ordered the coffin. He isn't home yet, and Mrs. Rogers is worried. Then take her. Come on, Dick. I'll be with you. I wouldn't care if the whole town was with us. What time is it? Four o'clock. It will soon be light. Please, Dick, you must. All right, all right. I'll get dressed and I'll go with you, but we'll wait for the dawn. But Mr. Rogers may be in trouble. Bill, whatever has happened has happened. I'll go with you, but not until it's light. Oh, my head. It hurts. Where... Where am I? Where you do not belong. Oh, it's you. Where's your coffin? Where it belongs. Good, good. Come, come. I'll take you home. You need more help than I do. I'll be all right. I was fortunate. It was just a glancing blow. I'll take you to the gate. See that you get there safely. You've changed. Why are you now worried about me? I admire your courage. You were concerned about me. Now I return the favor. No, no, no. You tried to frighten me before. For your own good. You're still in danger. From whom? From the damned. Sir, I don't know who you are or where you're from. But I'll swear you're of this world. There are no such things as ghosts. I know that's what you believe. I wish with all my heart that you were right. What's that music? Do you hear it? I do. What is it? It doesn't belong here in a graveyard. You're wrong. It's the only place it can be heard. And not by everyone. Come. Come, the gate is this way. No, no, I am not leaving until I get to the bottom of I this. I warn you, your persistence will be your destruction. I still put my trust in the Lord. Where's that music coming from? From beyond the grave. Is it Judgment Day? No. Then you talk nonsense. The dead will rise. The Lord will summon his elect to meet him in the clouds. But until that day, the dead remain buried. And quiet? And quiet. Oh, foolish man. I will not be able to protect you much longer. Go home now, while you can. I will, if you'll first allow me to take you to your home. Can't you understand? My home is here. Tommy Rot. I must go. I have work to do. You've been warned. My conscience is clear. As I turned my head to see where he went, I felt dizzy. The blow had evidently been more serious than I thought. When my head cleared, I could still hear the music, and I thought I saw a light. I walked toward the light. It seemed to come from the Addison tomb. As I approached, I could see that the door to the mausoleum was open. I was convinced that inside was the source of the music. It grew louder with every step I took. And then I found myself at the door to the tomb. And there, just inside, I saw the large coffin the stranger had ordered. The lid was wide open. But the moment I took one step inside, 
the lid slammed shut, and the music stopped. I thought the coffin had been empty, but I couldn't be sure. I walked over to it and bent down and listened. I heard the key turn in the lock, and I called out, You mustn't lock yourself in. You mustn't. Please open the coffin. He wouldn't listen, so I determined to get the coffin open. When suddenly there was a flash of light and a loud explosion. Bill, I can't see anyone in there. Mr. Rogers must have gone home. I can't see the whole cemetery from outside. We'll have to go in. The gate's locked. I have a key. Oh, look, do we really have to go on? It's practically daylight. There's nothing to be afraid of. I hear you, but I'm still shivering. That's the cold. Come on. Hey, you seem to know where you're going. I shouldn't have left him. If any harm has befallen him, I'll never forgive myself. Well, he shouldn't have been here at all. The last I saw of Mr. Rogers, he was heading for the Addison tomb. I have a feeling that if we find him at all, that's where he'll be. There's the tomb now. Oh, the door's open. Should it be? We'll find out. Wait. Wait. Suppose suppose there's something in that tomb that waited for Mr. Rogers, and now it's waiting for us. If you don't want to come in, you can wait here, but I'm going into that tomb. All right. All right. I'll come with you. Good Lord. There he is, lying across that coffin. And, and so still. Is he... Is he dead? I don't know. But there's only one way to find out. I can offer no explanation, but I can tell you that the words of a letter written more than 100 years ago had cast a spell over all of us. A spell that had transported us back to a small 19th century graveyard. I'll be back in a moment with the strange end to this strange tale. Like many time-worn sayings, the old adage, curiosity killed the cat, but satisfaction brought it back, still contains more than a few grains of truth. Certainly all of us sitting in the William Spindle's living room that night were anxiously waiting for him to resume reading the letter from his great-great-grandfather, but he further whetted our curiosity by prefacing his reading with this explanation. I think it's important to tell you that this next portion of the letter is an eyewitness account Not what was told to my ancestor, but what he experienced himself. So, uh, if you're all ready, I'll continue. After Mr. Rogers told me what had happened to him that night in the cemetery, I was still undecided about leaving the undertaking business, although my dear Lucy was at me every day to give my notice. And then, one morning, Mr. Rogers called me to his office. Sit down, Bill. I think we should have a talk. Yes, Mr. Rogers. My wife tells me that Lucy hasn't been to see her. Have you spoken again to Lucy about discussing your future here with Emily? No, sir. You still believe that our strange customer was a ghost? Let's say I'm still undecided. What's that? Probably someone who wants to see me. Come in. Should I get the door? Don't bother. I'll go. Good morning, gentlemen. It's you. It is indeed I. And I'm not sure how long I'll be permitted to stay. Long enough, I hope, to give me an explanation of your actions the other night. That is why I'm here. Good. Perhaps you'll start by telling me... I come here, sir, at great personal risk. I ask you to believe me. I beg you to listen and keep an open mind. I believe I'm a fair man. Since you're a native of this town, you must know of the Addison family. Of course. Old Thaddeus Addison owned the leather and dye plant. He did. And do you remember a young man named Tom Addison, one of Thaddeus's three sons? Mm, I never knew the young rascal. Everyone heard about him, of course. He was a 'er ne'er-do-well who finally ran away. That's what my father wanted everyone to believe. Hold on. Are you trying to tell me you're Tom Addison? My father wanted me to go into the factory. I couldn't abide the thought. In all modesty, I had a great talent for music, particularly the bass. A talent which my father felt was foolishness. All of our quarrels came because I wanted to practice my music and my father thought it was a waste of time and money. Then you are young Addison. I am. And I am not. 
Not in the sense that you mean. I suppose you can explain that. The situation between my father and me became unbearable. He finally gave me an ultimatum. Either I'd go into the business, abandon my music, or he'd turn me out of the house. I really had no choice. I left. Mm -hmm. And what brought you back? The very same thing that took me away. Music. When my father disowned me, I wandered around the country trying to earn my living as a musician. It wasn't easy. One day, I found someone who valued my musicianship. I made a bargain with him. Who was he? He goes by many names. Take your choice. Satan, the devil, Beelzebub, or the prince of darkness. Rubbish. You believe in the Lord. Why do you find it so difficult to believe in the devil? I'm a God-fearing man. The devil has no power over me. Not unless you invade his realm, as you did the other night. All I did the other night was my duty, as an undertaker and as a man. How can I make you see the horrors that lie ahead of you if you will not listen? What will change your foolish obstinacy so that you can save yourself? Are you so insensible that if I tell you what I have suffered and am suffering, you'll still close your mind to what I say? I promise to listen, and I will. Ten years ago, I was in Chicago, living in a cold and miserable garret, hungry, alone, and with no hope of employment. In order to get something to eat, I knew I'd have to pawn my fiddle. Just before venturing out, I wanted to play it one last time. When suddenly, I thought I'd lost my mind because not only was I hearing my own instrument, but it was joined, joined by a full symphony. And he was there. Satan? And he offered me the fulfillment of a dream. I would never have to worry about money again, and I could concentrate on my music. It dazzled me, the prospect of a life I'd always hoped for. And what did he ask in return? Your soul? Nothing so dramatic. What seemed a simple, harmless request. All he asked is that I play for him whenever and wherever he should ask. I hesitated, but only for a moment. How I wish I had thought longer on it, but I didn't. I agreed. And now I'm his forever. A member of his Orchestra of the Damned. And the letter closes as follows. That was the day I left the undertaking establishment of Edward Rogers. I have no way of knowing whether Mr. Rogers believed the story told by the man who claimed to be Tom Addison. I never saw nor heard from the stranger again. Nor do I know whether Mr. Rogers did. Signed, William Spindles. Now, what do you make of that? I'll take the ladies first. Cora, as my wife, what do you think? <laughs> There's one thing I know, darling... I'm glad you're not an undertaker, because if you were, I wouldn't be your wife. Ah, you feel the same way as my ancestor's girl, Lucy. Emphatically. Jerry, you're the scientist here. Well, history isn't a science, thank heaven, but I do have some questions. First, how did the coffin come into your possession? Well, that's simple. When Mr. Rogers died at the ripe old age of 89, he left a sizable bequest in his will to my great-grandfather with the proviso that we keep the coffin as a memento. But why would he do that? Now, that, Cora, is an excellent question. If he insisted that the coffin remain in your family as part of his bequest, I think he must have had a reason. In other words, you don't believe that the stranger was a ghost. Let's say I'm dead set against the idea of ghosts playing symphonic music in a graveyard at night. Well, I believe he was the ghost of Tom Addison. Well, how do you explain Rogers leaving the coffin to the Spindles family? Simple. Rogers was probably hurt by Bill's refusal to stay in the business, and he wanted the coffin to remind him. Sorry, darling, that won't work. If he was hurt, why also leave my ancestor a bundle? And believe me, it was a considerable sum. Well, then why did he, Bill? Mm, I'm stumped. <laughs> <laughs> it's too much for me. I still don't believe in ghosts, and I think I can prove to you that this man who ordered the coffin was flesh and blood. How? Well, I'm going to have to do a little research. When did you say all these things happened? Uh, the date, I mean. December 1851, why? Well, give me two days, and I'll let you know. Right? I have solved the mystery of our peculiarly shaped coffin. Good. How? 
I kept asking myself, why did this man go to all the trouble of ordering a coffin, which, to say the least, was strange, and also behave as if he wanted everyone to believe he was a ghost? But if you forgotten Mr. Rogers' belief that he was crazy... I mean, wouldn't that account for all his behavior? Yes, that would, but I preferred to think of this fellow as a con man. You see? A really great con man who successfully conned your grandfather but had more difficulty with the undertaker. Why? Precisely. Why? Now, that's where this newspaper article comes in. Here, I made a copy at the library. Let me read it to you. The headline, Wells Fargo Payroll Stolen. Ah, uh-huh. then it goes on. Yesterday, the largest robbery in the history of the Wells Fargo Company was successfully perpetrated by three masked men who boarded the westbound Lackawanna Limited, entered the baggage car, and made off with more than $40,000 in 10, 20, and $50 bills. So, it goes into more detail, but there you have it. There you have it. You've lost me. Now, don't you see? The robbers needed a safe place to hide the money. And you think that they decided to use a coffin as a hiding place? Remember... Our man insisted on a strong lock on the inside. That's true, but... That would be one way of making sure that no one opened this peculiar coffin by mistake and found a wad of tens, twenties, and fifties that had been stolen from Wells Fargo. But according to the letter, Mr. Rogers found the coffin in the cemetery. And it was open, and, and, and there was nothing in there. That's right, that's right. Rogers followed the stranger right from the funeral parlor to the cemetery. He wouldn't have had time to stash the loot in there. Uh, I think it's interesting, but rather far-fetched. Is it? Look how everything fits. All that uproar in the cemetery. All the warnings to Rogers telling him to keep away. Why? I'm sorry. You're so convinced your theory is right, you're not thinking straight. Once your man knows Rogers was going to interfere, he'd never have taken the chance of hiding anything there. Well, he may have had no choice. What do you mean? The money may have already been there. Look, have you forgotten that your grandfather's letter said that the workmen believed the coffin had been tampered with? Oh, Jerry, you're riding a hobby horse. Oh. You have a theory, and you're just going to see that everything fits. And you're not going to look at anything that doesn't. Now, wait a minute. What have I left out? Well, lots of things. Now, one, how in the world did our stranger lift this coffin and carry it off under his arm? Perhaps he didn't. <laughs> you mean you think Bill's grandfather made that part up? Well, let's leave that. Uh, Anything else? Well, lots. What about everything that happened to Mr. Rogers in the cemetery? The music, the open coffin. What's your explanation for that? Well, we know that Rogers fell down and hit his head. Oh, come off it, Jay. Are you not going to try and tell us that he imagined those things as a result of hitting his head? Well, it's it's possible. Maybe, but... I don't believe it. The other explanation, which you refuse even to think about, Jerry, is that he was a ghost and that Mr. Rogers reported everything faithfully. That's the one I believe. Even if I prove to you that this strange-looking coffin has plenty of room for some kind of secret compartment and there may be money in it? Why don't we stop talking and see if you can prove what you think? All right, good idea. Come on. How do we go about finding a secret compartment? Well, we'll try tapping and listen for a hollow sound. Okay. Who wants to do the tapping? Me. Let me. All right, go right ahead. Ah, it all sounds the same. You're too impatient. If there's a secret compartment, he'd make it hard to find. Right. Ah, dear. (laughs) It's a great theory, Jer. I'm afraid it's just a theory. Why don't you try down at the bottom where it's widest? Okay. There. (gasps) Right there. Does that sound different? I think so. Go back there again, Cora. That's it. Uh, Let's turn it upside down. Here. You have to... Let us do that, Cora. That's got it now. Now what? Well, I think we should have opened the lid first. Okay, let's open it. All right, now, put your hand down in there, Bill. Feel around carefully. I mean, um, around the joint in the wood. Yes. Do you feel anything? Nothing. I I can't. You got it. You got it. (laughs) Jerry was right. It's a secret compartment. Well, is there anything in there? This. Money? A $20 bill? Well, there must be more. No, the, just the one bill. But wait, wait. Here's a note. <gasps> well, what does it say? Oh, wait a second. It's hard to read. Dear Bill, or descendants of William Spindles, you having found this secret hiding place should know by now 
that I was right when I insisted that there were no such things as ghosts. I was also right when I told you, Bill, that there was a fortune to be made in the undertaking business, as is proven by my bequest. God bless you and your family. Signed, Edward Rogers. What do you do when you discover that the fortune you expected turns out to be a single $20 bill? Well, if you're William Spindles, you advance the idea that Edward Rogers had indeed found the Wells Fargo loot in the coffin and taken all of it except the one bill. Is there another explanation? I think so. And I'll be back with it in just a moment. For what it is worth, I present you with this thought. There never was any Wells Fargo money in the coffin to begin with. Edward Rogers had obviously been a man of strong beliefs, and he took this way of proving to Bill Spindles or his children that there are no such things as ghosts and that there was money to be made in the undertaking business. Did the Spindles accept my explanation? I really don't know. How about you? Our cast included Keir DeLay, Marion Seldes, William Redfield, Peter Collins, and Nat Polan. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. WCCO Radio, Las Vegas for three days and three nights.